Warning, this episode contains brain food that will lead to improved emotional and social intelligence. Thanks for tuning in to Harvesting Happiness today for a healthy serving of consciously prepared brain food. This is Lisa cypress Kamen, your host. For more than 13 years, I've been handcrafting these sound ideas for better well-being. Each week, I love spotlighting diverse thinkers and doers who are contemporary trendsetters and change agents devoting their lives to creating a better world in which to live. I invite you to listen up and change the way you think about human happiness. Our award-winning content is fresh, optimistic, and purpose-driven media that promotes well-being from the inside out. Alrighty then, let's dive in. This episode offers psychosocial education designed to inspire and motivate our listeners. The information provided does not constitute a therapeutic relationship nor a substitute for professional mental health care. If you are experiencing a mental health crisis, call 911, go to your nearest emergency room, or for listeners in the United States, text 988 for the National Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Thanks for joining me on today's show, where you will learn about nutritionally dense food wisdom for health and well-being. My guest today is Dr. Sarah Ballantyne. She has a PhD in medical biophysics and is the founder of Nutrivore.com and a New York Times bestselling author of the book, Nutrivore, The Radical New Science for getting the nutrients you need from the food you eat. Dr. Sarah creates educational resources to help people improve their day-to-day diet and lifestyle choices, empowered and informed by the most recent current evidence-based scientific research. With Nutrifor, Sarah has created a positive and inclusive approach to dietary guidance based in science and devoid of dogma using nutrient density and sufficiency as its basic principles, nourishment, not judgment. Sarah, thank you so much for joining me today. I am really eager to have this conversation for several reasons. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for having me. And I, I'm also excited. So let's dig in. Let's dig in. First off, I want to say that my daughter is about to finish her internship with a master's degree in science and dietetics. So you have caught my attention with your book and she is getting it as a gift when she graduates Aww. in a couple of weeks. So, well, congratulations yeah. to her. That's so exciting. It's very, very exciting. So, let's start at the beginning about the discovery of nutrients. Like, when did food be treated as science? So, nutritional sciences is one of the youngest fields of science. So when you look back at like the origins of physics or chemistry or biology, we can trace back some of those really key discoveries hundreds of years. Nutritional sciences started in 1785, just a few hundred years ago. And it actually started as part of the chemical revolution. So a time when chemical elements were first being identified, uh, the chemical element that peaked people's attention into understanding digestion and nutrition was nitrogen. So scientists realized that nitrogen was a component of grass and rotting beef. And once they realized that nitrogen was in both, they were like, well, maybe when the cows are eating the grass, that's how the nitrogen gets into their meat. So that led to protein as the first essential nutrient to be discovered. It was then nearly 200 years before the last amino acid, uh, essential amino acid was identified. So it took then, you know, many, many scientists, many, 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 many experiments, um, many different sort of collaborative efforts and that iterative understanding that the scientific process is to fully understand how we make proteins. But it all started with nitrogen. They actually originally called a protein nitrogenous substances or animal matter. And they would call it animal matter, even if they were talking about proteins and plants, because they didn't understand what it was that they were looking at yet. Wow. That is super fascinating, actually. I did not know that. When we look at the history of nutrient profiling and the book that you've written, your book, Nutrivore, you talk about a scoring system for how Mm -hmm. to rate 
our foods. And I would love for you to cross-reference that rating system and a little bit of the history and how this actually impacts our our health on a day-to-day basis. So in nutritional sciences, after we discovered the importance of protein and fat, the next class of nutrients to be discovered was minerals. And vitamins kind of came a long ways after. So vitamin A was only uh, isolated for the first time in 1937. And actually we are still continuing to like learn about what vitamins and minerals do in the body. The concept of a nutrient-dense food was only coined in the 1970s. That's how recent the idea of a food having a lot of nutrients actually comes. And when it was first sort of uh, defined, it was very loosely defined as any food that had substantial amounts of nutrients per serving. Now that actually got us into some trouble because uh, a serving, like what substantial is, that can mean a lot of different things. A serving can mean a lot of different things in terms of how that food contributes to our overall diet. So you think about a serving of lettuce versus a serving of potato chips. It's quite a, a big difference in terms of <laughs> yes. the caloric contribution. So in the early 2000s, uh, scientists kind of got together and went, okay, we're thinking about nutrient density incorrectly. Let's redefine a nutrient-dense food as one that offers a significant amount of nutrients per calorie. So we're going to now use energy density as our uh, as our denominator, right? So as as the the thing that we're going to divide by in this calculation. And so then scientists all over the world started developing different ways of actually calculating it. So how do we actually put math to this definition? And there have been a few dozen different nutrient density scores developed over the years. I developed my own because my initial intention was to pick pick whichever was the best. I spent three months just diving into this research and reading everything I could about different nutrient density scores. And I realized pretty quickly that one of the challenges that the science of nutrient profiling has right now is that most of the efforts are being put towards figuring out which nutrients to put into a calculation so that the end score aligns with dietary guidelines for Americans. Whereas my perspective is I want to understand the food and then figure out what that tells me about whether or not adjustments are required to dietary recommendations. So I developed the Nutrivore score, which is algorithmically identical to the Nutrient-Rich Food Index, which is one that's been around for a little over 20 years. But instead of using nine or 15 nutrients in the calculation, I use 33. So I use every nutrient that I have enough data that it makes sense to include it in the math. And then I get to see what that tells me about the quality of the calories of a food, right? So like how much nutrition am I getting for how many calories that food is going to to contribute to my overall diet? So that is what the Nutrivore score tells us. So it's it's not just about like if it's nutritionally sound, but it's the value of what is in the, like how much does that really contribute to the vitamins and minerals that we need on a daily basis? So it is a mathematical calculation yeah. that basically translates to total nutrients per calorie. So when we go to your model of lettuce versus potato chips, my guess, and you're you're going to correct me because you're the doctor is that neither rate particularly high. Lettuce is is a good thing. actually untrue. So lettuce ranks extremely high, even iceberg lettuce, which has a reputation of being like (laughs) loser lettuce (laughs) or nutritional cardboard. And it's because we're trying to understand the nutrients per calorie. So a very low calorie food like lettuce doesn't have to have a ton of nutrition to end up with a really high Nutrivore score. Lettuce actually does. It's it. Most varieties of lettuce will have nearly our entire daily value of vitamin K. They're usually pretty good sources of folate and biotin. And then they have a lot of classes of um, phytonutrients, which are non-essential, but very beneficial antioxidants found in plant foods that are really helpful. So lettuce varieties have a lot of carotenoids as well as polyphenols. So we do actually get some really valuable nutrition from lettuce. Yes, even iceberg lettuce. But we don't have to have like tons and tons and tons in order to have a really impressive amount of nutrition per calorie because it's so low calorie. 
potato chips are higher calorie food. So potato chips have to have a lot of nutrition in order to have a high score of nutrients per calorie. And potato chips do have some, like they have some potassium, right? They do, they do have some valuable nutrition, but they also have very high calories. So in the math, it works out to be a fairly low Nutrifor score. So let's talk about fatty foods, for example, like avocados or nut butters and things like that, that do have a lot of nutrition in them, but they're high in calories. How do they score? So um, generally, I would say they're like all around, they all end up with a score around 200 is kind of like the middle of the road for foods like avocado, olives, nuts, and nut butters. Whereas like lettuce is typically around 2000. Um, But if you, so I don't like using the score to label a food as good or bad. I think it's a really fascinating way to look at food and to understand how that food can contribute to our overall nutrient intake. But there are foods with lower scores that are really nutritionally valuable foods, right? So like, you know, almonds around 200 or avocados, which I think are closer, if I remember correctly, they're closer to 160. Um, They are some of, they are our best food sources of vitamin E. They are rich in heart healthy fats. They've got really, they're actually quite fiber dense foods. Um, And then they have, you know, a smattering of other vitamins and minerals. Avocados are another great source of potassium, for example. So they're very beneficial foods, even though they don't have like a super high Nutrifor score. But if you were to like just do the math, anything with a Nutrifor score over about 150 actually contributes more nutrients than calories to our diets. So these scores around 200 are still foods that have a lot of nutrition per calorie. They're useful. I do like what you've created in that sense, because it's not like we're going to be calorie counting or we're going to be scoring everything we put in our mouths, but we have an idea if we're sort of eating in the zone that we're doing pretty well with how we're feeding ourselves. I also love, I mean, for me, my favorite thing about the Nutrifor score is the redemption arc stories. It is being able to say that iceberg lettuce has more nutrients per calorie than Incredible. celery it or has than, a bad rap. Uh, artichoke. <laughs> right. And an unfair, like bad rap. Watermelon has a Nutrifor score of 400, 405, something like that. It's the second most nutrient dense melon after cantaloupe. And yet we think of watermelon as just being like sugar water, but it yeah. actually has tons of nutrition. It is the second best food source of lycopene after tomatoes. No way. And it has this really cool amino acid in it called L-citrulline. L-citrulline isn't even in the score also. L-citrulline has been shown to improve exercise performance. It's one of the like supplements that people will take in a, in a pre-workout like supplement mix. So we can get that from watermelon. And so I love I love the redemption arcs, but the most practical way to use the Nutrifor score is to figure out like really simple swaps on your, in your meal. So what is this? Like I'm making, I'm making a pasta dish. So instead of regular noodles, uh, why don't I swap those out for whole wheat noodles, right? That's going to have a higher Nutrifor score, or I could swap those whole wheat noodles out for, I love all these like legume based noodles now, like lentil noodles and chickpea noodles, edamame noodles. Those are going to be about four times more nutrient dense than a regular pasta noodle. So what, what is like the really easy thing that I can swap out? I'm still going to enjoy this meal. It's still going to taste the same, but I'm going to end up really dramatically increasing my nutrient intake. And that is my favorite way to use the Nutrifor score. Which ostensibly increases our health, increases Mm -hmm. our performance and our output because the, the engine is running more cleanly, right? If, if, If we liken our bodies to an automobile or a machine, This is pretty cool. I want to go back to one thing before we go to the break, and that is when we talk about the history of nutrition and nutrients, it dawned on me as you were speaking about superfoods probably were part of the average person's diet until industrialization. Yes. Yes. Like no one thought of it any differently, right? And if you think back to the number of like garden crops that were really prevalent in you know all over all over the world sort of pre-industrialization and pre sort of like the grocery store like how many people were growing fruits and vegetables in their backyard and we ate 
I think a lot of plants that have not like they're just not popular anymore. Like we've forgotten, I think, unless you're like a, a gardener or a forager, we have forgotten that they're edible. And there's even not, there's not even like nutrition data for a lot of them anymore, but some of them we look at. So I live in the South where pokeweed grows all over the place. What's pokeweed? And pokeweed <laughs> so it, it's a fascinating plant because it is all parts of the plant are toxic except for the shoots. So this time of year, the young shoots and you need to, you need, I would, I would highly recommend uh, like actually finding a forager to learn this from and not learn this from me. So please, uh, <laughs> nobody just go no do po- this. No poke weed um, advice here, actually. But <laughs> up until the seventies, <laughs> you could actually get poke, it's poke salad. Uh, you used to be able to get it canned in the grocery store. And all you have to do is you have to know what like what part of the plant to harvest at what time of year. And then you have to boil it a couple of times before you eat it to get rid of some chemicals in it that can be toxic. Even after you do that, it's about the same nutrient density as spinach. Like even after you've boiled it twice wow. and discarded the water, That's it is incredible. so crazy nutritious. And it is one of those foods that because, I mean, I think that that fear is is rational, right? Because I know that all the other parts of the food are toxic and I have to prepare it in a special way. It is a little bit intimidating, but it's a great example of a food that was a cultural staple in the South for centuries that has just kind of been forgotten in the last few decades because they stopped making the canned version because not enough people were buying it. And you get, you know, urbanization and you get used to just buying your your same old broccoli and carrots at the grocery store. And you kind of forget about these foods that used to just grow in everyone's backyards. Like I have some in my backyard that I'm kind of leaving there because I'm looking forward to the the time when the patch is big enough that I can like harvest a bunch and make it. Wow. That's pretty cool. Let's take a pause. And when we come back, we will continue the conversation with my guest today, Dr. Sarah Ballantyne. We're talking about her book, Nutrivore, The Radical New Science of Getting the Nutrients You Need from the Food You Eat. To learn more, please visit Nutrivore.com. And on X, Facebook, and Instagram, you can find Dr. Sarah at Dr. Sarah Ballantyne. And that's Sarah with an H. Here comes the pause. We'll be right back. Wait, wait, wait. Before we pause, let's talk about the summer heat and how it affects our hair. Sun, salt, and SPF can impact our hair health, and just like our skin, the condition of our hair reflects our overall health. Both external and internal factors can impact the way our hair looks, feels, and grows, and that's why I use and love Nutrafol to keep my strands strong. Nutrafol is the number one dermatologist-recommended hair growth supplement, with over 1 million people seeing thicker, stronger, faster-growing hair with less shedding. Thinning is different for men and women, and that's why Nutrafol has five formulas for different lifestyles, including plant-based diets. Nutrafol is tailored to what your hair needs based on biology to grow. Physician formulated and drug-free, Nutrafol supports healthy hair growth from within to target the key root causes of thinning, including stress, hormones, environment, nutrition, lifestyle, and metabolism, all through whole body health. In clinical studies, 86% of women saw improved growth after taking Nutrafol supplements twice daily for six months, and 72% of men saw more scalp coverage after six months. I've been using Nutrafol religiously for more than two years. Shedding has been significantly reduced. My hair is now thicker and healthier because of Nutrafol. Plus, some remarkable bonus side benefits include better sleep, improved stress response, and a significant reduction of those pesky menopause symptoms, including hot flashes. No matter your lifestyle or stage of life, Nutrafol is a great solution that targets the root causes of thinning and supports hair growth from within. Nourishing your hair with a growth routine is simple. Get Nutrafol sent right to your door with easy online purchasing, no prescriptions or doctor's visits required. Automated deliveries ensure you'll never miss a day and you'll see results in three to six months. Get results you can run your fingers through. For a limited time, Nutrafol is offering our listeners $10 off your first month subscription and free shipping when you go to Nutrafol.com and enter the promo code HH. Find out why over 4,500 healthcare professionals and stylists recommend Nutrafol for healthier hair. Nutrafol, spelled N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L 
Nutrafol.com, promo code HH. That's Nutrafol.com, promo code HH. Now let's take that pause. We'll be right back. Each day we have the intellectual freedom to be happy or the liberty to be miserable, regardless of external circumstance. If you or someone you know is struggling with mental health, seek support because good psychological health is vital in the achievement of a happy and satisfying life. Visit HarvestingHappiness.com for psychosocial educational resources to boost emotional and social intelligence. Like what you hear on Harvesting Happiness? Sharing is caring. Pay it forward by spreading the word to your community and through social media. Subscribe, listen, and share hundreds of downloadable episodes from wherever you get your podcasts. Connect with and follow us on most social media channels. And we're back continuing the conversation with Dr. Sarah Ballantyne. We're talking about nutritionally dense food wisdom for health and well-being. Let's get back to it. So Sarah, let's go back to the list of like the Uber foods, like the most incredibly nutritionally dense foods that we can gift ourselves on a daily basis or seasonal basis. In my book, I identify what I call of 12 foundational food families. So these are the foods that they're not just that they're the most nutrient dense foods. They're the ones that have something to offer us unique nutritionally. And so when we prioritize each of these in our diets, it makes it easiest to get all of the nutrients that our bodies need from the foods we eat, which is the goal of Nutribor. It doesn't mean it's the only foods we eat. And it also doesn't mean that you have to eat them. It is just like the most efficient path to Nutribor. So I want to make sure that that caveat is well uh, said before I list them. So it's vegetables in general. I mean, vegetables, all vegetables are nutritious choices, but among vegetables, root vegetables, leafy vegetables, cruciferous vegetables, which is the cabbage family, mushrooms, and alliums, which is the onion family, they all have something special for us. They're all really closely tied to improved health outcomes. Then we have fruit in general. So fruit, I think, gets a really bad rap as being nature's candy, but there's so much science showing that fruit in moderation is extremely beneficial for us and better for us than eating no fruit. And then we have citrus fruits, uh, which have some like really special fiber types and phytonutrients that actually are really, really important for mental health. So they they get elevated to foundational food ding, status. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> Berries, uh, which also, right, most concentrated food source of some special fiber types and some special phytonutrients. Then legumes, pulse type legumes is really what we're talking about because something like green beans would are classified nutritionally as a vegetable. Nuts and seeds, seafood, and I think I said all of them, but I, but I think I was counting on my fingers wrong. That's okay. Yes, I'm I'm pretty sure. I'm you're pretty sure we got the ball. close enough. Everybody should just buy the book. <laughs> That's it. Ball, for sure. <laughs> but you know, so going uh, going back to how we feed our faces, how we take care of our bodies and we maybe dissect a recipe. For example, mm-hmm. like you've given all these classes of foods that are really high in nutrients. I'm really attached to watermelon based upon what you shared in the first segment cuz that's pretty a pretty high score. So let, summer's here, spring is here. Let's let's pick a salad of some kind and and okay. figure out how we might might alter it. Like I'll tell you one that I make and then you can tell me score and how to improve. So okay. arugula, quinoa, Ooh, yeah. mm-hmm. watermelon, olive oil. Delicious. Okay. Maybe some mint fresh mint. Wow. Yeah. And goat cheese. Oh my gosh. I am loving that just so much. (laughs) Um, well, I'm some, I'm salivating. So obviously that's what I'm going to try to make for lunch. So arugula is a cruciferous leafy green, which means it's, it's one of our, our most nutrient dense options. Kale is a little bit higher, but I feel like in that salad, a better like swap if we we're going to try to like up that up would be watercress. So watercress Ooh. has more than three times the nutrient density of arugula. It is seasonal. It's a little bit harder to find. And if we're planning the salad months in advance, we can actually grow one of the, like the second most nutrient dense food is garden cress, which is found in grocery stores in Europe. It's not so much found in grocery stores in North America. It is arugulas and watercresses like 
big sister. Very, very, very spicy. Uh, it's got that that mm-hmm. that That's peppery thing, thing that we like. The spice, it yes. is so much. It's very easy to grow as a microgreen. Uh, so it is very straightforward. You can grow it in a jar uh, in your like really? windowsill. So garden cress is like almost it's probably eight times more nutrient dense than arugula it is one of the most nutrient dense foods that we could possibly choose so if we're going to up our if we're going to do a swap for a green those those would be our swaps okay i think um so we said arugula quinoa is a very nutrient dense uh it's actually pseudo grain amaranth is more nutrient dense. So I would say a great swap for quinoa would be amaranth. And amaranth is really cool because it is related to beets. So it has, so the thing that makes amaranth grain a little bit, that kind of red color that amaranth is, is different than what makes most fruits and vegetables red. Most fruits and vegetables get their like red, purple, blue colors from anthocyanins. The beet family, including amaranth, gets its red color from betalanes, which uh, we don't, don't, you don't find them in the same plant. So you never find anthocyanins and betalanes in the same plant. And betalanes are particularly beneficial. They um, very strongly reduce risk of cardiovascular disease, but they've also been shown to improve muscle recovery after a workout, whether you are a trained athlete or just starting out. So Beetlings are like a fascinating phytonutrient that unless you love like beets and rainbow chard, you're probably not getting very much of. So I think amaranth is a great swap Ooh, for the quinoa. I like that. And in that salad. That nutty? Hang on one sec. I'm sorry I interrupted yeah. you, but is it a little nutty tasting amaranth? It, when yes, it's, absolutely. Yes. yes. And I feel, uh, but it's got a very similar texture to quinoa. Like it's it's uh, texturally quite, quite similar, uh, slightly nuttier, a slightly earthier flavor. And that also kind of comes from being part of our, of the beet family, but it's not, I know beets are kind of like a love it or hate it vegetable. Um, it is no, not anywhere in that vicinity. So you don't have, you can like amaranth and not like beets. Like that is a, a I think I feel like a normal flavor preference. Yeah. I don't know if I have a, a, a swap option for watermelon. I think, I think we kind of peaked with watermelon. That's top knowledge. I think olive oil is peak. I don't have a healthier swap for olive oil. You've got your oleic acid, which is an incredibly heart healthy fat. You've got lots of vitamin E. You've got polyphenols. You've got another class of phytonutrient called triterpenes, which have been shown to be very beneficial for a lot of health outcomes. So I think we've peaked with olive oil. And I I kind of think we've done the same with goat cheese. So cheese is our most concentrated food source of calcium. And especially if we're consuming a cheese from made with grass-fed dairy, which goat milk tends to be, you have a really cool fat in there called conjugated linoleic acid, which Mm. is research into this fat is still early. So I don't want to make too strong of health claims. Like I want to, I want to caveat the health claims around conjugated linoleic acid to say we do, we do need some like bigger studies to be able to really say for sure. But there's early research to suggest that it can reduce risk of cardiovascular disease, some forms of cancer, and it can also facilitate weight loss. So uh, conjugated linoleic acid is also a fascinating one, and we're getting that from the goat cheese. So I think there's only a couple of places where we can do a swap to the salad. I would add one addition, and my addition would be something like walnuts. I think flavor-wise, I think think we're in the right Vicinity. Yes, walnuts and, or pistachios. Or pistachios. I mm-hmm. think a nutter seed in the salad would help to sort of diversify the nutrients that we are getting. We would start to get more alpha linolenic acid, which is a beneficial omega-3 fat that we can get from nuts and seeds. We would also, we would also like we would still get our vitamin E. So we would add to that. We would get some different types of fiber that are really important. important, And we would add a lot of minerals. So that is the other kind of really great thing that, that nuts and seeds have. What is so incredible about this is not only is it creative, right? It's fun. Like you're, we're taking things that we might normally like and eat anyway, and how to kind of amplify them and make yeah. them a little bit uh, more nutritionally sound. And that's exciting to me. Like, I mean, because you can like write your own recipes. You could, you can do some pretty neat stuff. And I don't know, I think it's pretty awesome. We're out of time. And I want to talk about brain food 
for a second because yes. this show we've been we pride ourselves on creating consciously prepared brain food and the work that you do the science based work that you're doing is also focusing on the use of food to feed our bodies and our brains so if you could send us off with a couple great brain foods that would be awesome so the second part of my book is entirely dedicated to examining the link between one specific nutrient and foods rich in that nutrient and one common health complaint. And there's actually a couple of sections that touch on brain health. So I have a section where I go into the importance of the types of omega-3 fats we get in seafood and reducing risk of neurodegenerative disease and age-related cognitive decline. And I examine all of the cool science showing the benefits of any type of fish that you want. But I also have a section on just that kind of amorphous brain fog that I think we all get before it's really clearly age-related cognitive decline <laughs> and the importance of vitamin B12 for neurological health. And vitamin B12, funnily enough, we also get very abundantly in shellfish. So we get, you know, we're kind of used to thinking of red meat as being a great source of B12, but actually clams and oysters and mussels are even more concentrated food sources of vitamin B12 than red meat. Wow. So much to digest. And that's why everybody needs to go out and buy the book, Nutrivore, the radical new science for getting the nutrients you need about the food you eat. Thank you, Dr. Sarah Ballantyne. I love this conversation. Oh, it's thank you so much. <laughs> made me hungry. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go make that salad now. To learn more, please visit Nutrivore.com and on X, Facebook, and Instagram, you can find Dr. Sarah Ballantyne at Dr. Sarah Ballantyne, and that's Sarah with an H. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on Harvesting Happiness today. This is Lisa Cypress Kamen on behalf of my guest, Dr. Sarah Ballantyne, wishing you kind thoughts, kinder words, and the kindest of actions. Until next time, remember, happiness is an inside job. Happiness is your inside job. Please go out and rock your day and remember to be kind to one another. Want to take a deeper dive into sound ideas for better well-being? Check out our new bonus edition content, More Mental Fitness by Harvesting Happiness, available exclusively on Medium and Substack. Keep harvesting your own happiness anytime, anywhere from the comfort of wherever you are. Subscribe, listen, and share hundreds of downloadable episodes from wherever you get your podcasts. Connect with and follow us on most social media channels. To learn more about lifestyle management and mental fitness consulting services, please visit HarvestingHappiness.com. Harvesting Happiness and More Mental Fitness are produced by me, Lisa Cypress Kamen, Andrea Mengeli, Robin Boyd, Andrea Daly, and the awesome team at Podfly Productions, including Eric Begay, Kimberly Beck, and Alec Guess, in collaboration with TogiNet Radio, KBUU, RadioMalibu.net, and is available on PRX, the public radio exchange. <laughs>